If a gelatinous goo started digesting people and growing in size, what would you do? In this How to Beat video, we'll follow the townsfolk, see if we can make better decisions, and ultimately attempt to beat the killer jello in The Blob. If you think you have a better way, let me know in the comments. If you like these How to Beat videos, consider subscribing. We start out following some small town people doing usual small town stuff. The jock asks the cheerleader out, the greaser tries to jump a bridge on his motorcycle, the town sheriff courts the diner waitress, and a homeless man investigates a UFO crash. We cut over to some jocks investing in protection for their dates tonight. I think their dates are gonna need protection from a different kind of goo. Know what I'm saying? The homeless man and his dog arrive at the crash site, but instead of high-tech saucers and little green men, he finds an egg-looking thing with lava goo in it. That's the actual technical scientific description of it, by the way. He grabs a stick to poke the goo and his dog heads out. The goo latches onto the stick and he raises it over his head as the goo is dripping off of it. Right as he sets the stick down, the goo on his stick lurches over to his hand. Do I even need to point out the mistakes? No, but I will anyways. To be honest, if I saw a UFO crash within 100 yards of me, I'd probably check it out too. How many people wish they knew what actually went down at Roswell? However, I sure as fuck am not going to poke some alien goo with a stick and raise the dripping goo over my head. I'd be hesitant to touch anything or get within breathing distance just in case there were alien pathogens present. I don't want to end up like the aliens in War of the Worlds or the dipshits in Alien Covenant. But this concern may be unfounded. Upon further reading, it appears pathogenesis requires intimacy. Alien microbes won't be able to infect our cells because they haven't developed the right key to access and infect our highly specific cell and protein structures. The alien microbes would need millions of years of coevolution to develop this key. There is still potential for the microbes to do some harm to us or our ecological system in other ways, which is why scientists are researching containment measures for future space exploration. I still think it's wise to not get handsy with any meteorites or UFOs. Once I satisfy my curiosity, I'd hightail it out of there before the men in black arrive and flash my memory or make me mysteriously die in order to tie up loose ends that could threaten national security. You could stick around and if you're lucky, the secret government organization that shows up will buy you a new truck in exchange for your silence. There's an appetizing segue to a kid slurping up red jello. Ironically, the homeless man is getting slurped up by the jello. The jock arrives to pick up his date, but just before they head out, she has Paul meet her dad. Daddy, I'd like you to meet my friend Paul. Ribbed. Ooh. Why the hell is this guy fixing his motorcycle at night in the forest? Just come back tomorrow, it's not like you have a pressing schedule. The homeless man leaps out of the forest and starts trying to hatchet his arm off in front of the kid. The blob quickly covers the axe wound to prevent him from fully severing himself from the goo. Chopping his arm off is a good call, but his execution is flawed. With this thing growing and consuming more and more of his arm by the minute, he doesn't have much time. As soon as the blob reaches his torso or head, there will be no way to separate himself from it. He needs to act fast and decisively. It's a bit tough to get strong leverage and power when swinging a hatchet at his own arm. As of now, the blob is on his hand and at his wrist. He needs to amputate at mid forearm, which means he needs to break through the ulna and radius bones. If he's got a canteen of hard liquor on him, it'd be a good idea to take a few big swigs. If he has a belt, he might want to take it off to bite down on it. He'd want to lay his arm down on something first, so the full impact of the hatchet will be transferred into his arm. If he just sticks his arm out and hits it, his arm will recoil, softening the blow. It would be much easier if he could communicate the issue to the greaser and have him swing the hatchet. A younger, stronger man with full leverage on it could probably sever it in a couple swings and won't be stopped by the pain. Once they chop the blob off, they need to go to the police station to radio war robots Space Tech Megacorp for help. Space Tech's war robots are outfitted with energy weapons that should easily be able to turn the blob into a pile of ash. War Robots is a tactical PvP shooter where you pilot giant
tank combat robots and face off against millions of other players worldwide. The Arborville townsfolk are completely unprepared for the blob. They need battle-hardened war robot pilots who can be trained with a variety of skills to tailor their fighting style and abilities for the threats on the battlefield. The war robots they're piloting are also highly customizable. You can sacrifice firepower for armor to tank damage, or choose a small, fast, lightly armored robot with long-range weapons that can flank and spank. The ideal war robot for killing our movie Blob would be quicker than the Blob, decently armored against pseudopod attacks, and be loaded with close-range weaponry like flamethrowers. Download the game with my link and you'll receive a free robot, a weapon, a unique skin, 100 gold, and 50,000 silver. This robot will get you up and running, but with 61 robots, 67 weapons, a wide variety of pilot skills and robot abilities, tons of different maps, and constant content updates, there are endless possibilities for creating your ultimate war robot. Download War Robots, choose your playstyle, and test it in combat. Thanks to War Robots for sponsoring this video. Once amputated, they need to get this sweet fuck away from the blob, then apply an improvised tourniquet out of inch thick cloth that they can torque around his upper arm to stop the blood flow from the brachial artery. It's common to think to use a belt, but belts make for shitty tourniquets. As the greaser, if a guy ran up to me while hatcheting himself with weird goo on his hand, I don't think my first inclination would be to stick around and help. The greaser is a better man than me, and runs after the panicking homeless man. I guess the jock cleared up the dad's misunderstanding about the condoms because the dad let his daughter go out on the date anyways. Really? What dad would believe that story? Oh, the condom was for your friend, you said. Not for you to use when banging out my daughter. Okay, sure, go ahead and take her down dark roads to an isolated location in a time period where cell phones don't exist. This town must be really small because somehow Paul and his date slam into the jock and the homeless man. Normally, you'd only want to move the victim to get them out of the road or danger, and then call 911. Moving a pedestrian you just struck is not advised because you could cause their injuries to worsen. But this is the 1950s and nobody had cell phones, so throwing him in the car and taking him to the hospital is really the only option. He obviously got some weird shit on his hand, which I'd definitely check out before tossing him in my car. The greaser also could have given a better description of it as well. He literally saw it move and consume more of the guy's hand after he axed it. Paul doesn't know what the goo is, but he does know that there's no sign of any immediately fatal injuries. I'd be tempted to drive down to the hospital and have them bring an ambulance back instead of having this weird goo shit in my car. They all hop into the car and head to the hospital. The doctors bring the homeless man into a back room to be checked out. Apparently, none of the nurses or doctors felt the need to radio for help or monitor the unknown corrosive goo that is slowly consuming this man. They just put a blanket over him and called it a day. How on earth is that a reasonable medical response? Damn, looks like cheese that was left in the microwave too long. I don't get why the blob didn't consume the rest of him though. From Paul's perspective, it just looks like the body was dissolved by a corrosive substance. There's nothing to indicate that the goo is still present or moved. Either way, calling the cops and taking a tissue sample would be beneficial for figuring out what the substance is. There is a chance that all of the blob substance may have left his body, leaving only the corroded flesh so there might not be an actual sample of the blob that could be obtained. While the doctor gets the underpaid nurse to clean up the nuked cheese whiz remains of the homeless man, Paul rushes into the doctor's office and calls the sheriff to warn him that there's a dangerous substance that just liquefied a man in minutes. Paul has made mostly reasonable decisions so far, but it's not enough. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Holy shit, that has got to be one of the most disturbing ways to die I've seen in a movie. Having your body swallowed by a massive alien amoeba that's secreting highly corrosive gastric acid to digest you while you're screaming for your life and struggling to break free. He just wasn't able to recognize the nature of the threat in time. Meg somehow knocked herself out or fainted after Paul was dissolved and she tugged his arm off. Paul and the homeless man had the most knowledge of the situation, but with their death, a lot of tactical info has been lost. Meg's account combined with the doctor's should be enough to convince the cops. Sure, the doctor wasn't there when Meg was knocked unconscious, but since the blob stomached Paul, then obviously consumed Paul's torn off arm since the police had no evidence that Paul was dead, Meg's unconscious body should have been consumed since she was right next to Paul's arm. I suspect that the doctor or nurse pulled Meg out of the room before the blob got to her. Of course, the police just say that she's hysterical and doesn't know what she's talking about, and that she just needs a good night's sleep. I still think that the doctor and the homeless man's corpse should corroborate her story, but I get that it's a hard sell. I got a call into Paul Taylor's folks. They haven't heard from me. Well, let's face it, Bill. They're not going to. He is correct. As we saw in my How to Beat Dr. Neville in I Am Legend video, people who get abducted are extremely unlikely to be found alive. The cops call for an autopsy. The autopsy results should be ready by midday the next day. With how fast the blob grew and can kill its prey, a lot more people will die before the results are in. We still don't know if anything meaningful would even come from a biopsy, so relying on this for awareness and defense is useless. In the meantime, the sheriff and his deputy suspect that Paul was abducted and killed by somebody, possibly Brian Flagg. Scott's non-consensual date with Vicky doesn't go so well either. The jocks are zero for two tonight. <laughs> What's interesting is that the blob must have been pretty big after consuming Paul, and it just crawled into the car from the driver's side door, but it didn't corrode the car seats or Vicky initially. I'm guessing the blob only secretes gastric acids once it has prey it wants to digest. The blob must have snuck into the back seat, then latched into Vicky's neck or brain in order to keep her still, then waited for Scott to reach closer before attacking him. That's a really intelligent devious strategy for a blob. Like Paul, only the car and broken window will be left. Nobody will find it for a while, nor would they know how Vicky and Scott died. So far, Meg is the only living person that knows the danger everyone's in. Meg's a smart girl for not taking the sleeping pill. With what you saw, you need to be alert and figuring out how to stop this thing. I'd be recounting everything I knew about this creature so far. Meg first saw Brian with the homeless man who had goo on his hand only. The homeless man not an hour later got dissolved and killed. Paul, being a football player, is pretty strong and quick, but he couldn't escape or break free from it. This means the blob must be very strong, but also adept at cornering and trapping its victims. The blob consuming Paul was already massive and must have grown by consuming the homeless man. It made it from the homeless man's bed over to the doctor's office, and since the blob is gelatinous, it can squeeze through tight spaces like plumbing and HVAC systems. The blob's mission is to consume and grow in size, but since it was no longer at the hospital killing people when the police showed up, this suggests that the blob is intelligent enough to be sneaky. It's most likely using the plumbing and sewer systems to move around. For now, if you have to go to the bathroom, it's safest just to shit in a bucket or something. The movie didn't take it this far, but I'll let your imagination work out why it wouldn't be a good idea to be sitting on a toilet with a blob on the loose. It's intelligent, but it didn't appear to have a brain. It just looked like a pile of goo. I hope Meg paid attention in science class. In a way, this blob is similar to slime molds like Dictyostelium discoideum, which are brainless, nervous systemless social amoeba superorganisms that use a form of decentralized swarm intelligence called quorum sensing to hunt prey via chemical signals. The blob could be hunting us by the cells of our body odor, dead skin cells that we constantly shed, or something similar. Once they find their prey, they use phagocytosis to capture and 
engulf and ingest it by lowering the pH level in its food vacuole by secreting a highly corrosive and acidic acid which it uses to break down their bodies for digestion, like our own stomachs do. With how fast it dissolved Paul, it's using something much more corrosive than what's in our stomachs. Even some of the most corrosive chemicals like hydrofluoric acid, sulfuric acid, or sodium hydroxide would take hours at minimum to do what this thing is doing in seconds. This means that in order to destroy the blob, you have to destroy all of the blob. Kinetic weapons like rifle bullets don't damage enough of the blob cells to stop it. The easiest way to destroy the blob would be with fire. Even the most thermal resistant extremophiles couldn't survive being placed over a household candle. For this reason, electricity works as well. Same thing with cold temperatures. While some extremophiles can survive a negative 110 degrees due to their antifreeze protein production, no known amoebas have this ability, and something like liquid nitrogen at negative 330 degrees would straight up destroy the cells via crystallization. Basically, Meg needs a fucking flamethrower and a biosuit to mask her chemical signals. Since she doesn't have access to a steady supply of flamethrowers like the Norwegian researchers in the thing, and since the blob has no doubt grown to an enormous size by now, she needs outside help. But that's also hard for Meg to do when nobody believes her, and cameras are out because in 1958, cameras sucked and the film took weeks to develop. Meg sneaks out to try to find Brian Flagg. He was the closest person to Patient Zero, aka Can Man, so it makes sense to see what he knows. Her best defense is being proactive and not being surprised, and keeping an eye on the blob as much as possible while trying to warn people. If I was Meg, I'd get in my car or Paul's car since he isn't going to be needing it, and park outside the police station or head to wherever the police were. Then, follow any police cars that responded to any incidents. It's the fastest way to find where the blob is, get more info on how big it is now, how it killed others, and where it goes. The blob is a close range killer, so staying in open ground is important. Slime molds typically prefer moist, shaded areas, so you definitely don't want to be reaching into the sewer drains to retrieve your paper boat. Meg and Brian grab a bite to eat at the diner, and unfortunately for Meg, Brian really doesn't know shit about the blob. In the back of the kitchen, the pipes seem to be clogged up by something. I will never stick my hand down a sink like that for the same reason I won't stick my hand in murky bathtub water. I'm way too paranoid. And that's why you let other people unclog your drains. The greaser and Meg escaped to the fridge, where the blob froze up and couldn't move. They got super lucky that the blob didn't just bust the door down and suit upon their faces like the cook. The waitress runs for the phone booth to call the cops. Big mistake. Confined spaces are your enemy, and the phone booth is the last place you want to be, especially right outside the diner when the blob is chasing you. The police station is like 40 yards away from the diner anyways, just run there. The blob initiates phagocytosis and engulfs the phone booth with her inside. In her final moments before being digested, she sees Herb's dissolving corpse in the blob. <laughs> Leaving the freezer is dangerous, but they have to leave at some point. Grabbing a brick to break the window if necessary is a good call to avoid being trapped and to make a quick escape through the front considering the door is locked. The pastor shows up to the diner too. God, everyone in this town is the munchies apparently. He sees what's left of the waitress before the goo seeps back into the sewer system and has the bright idea to go into the crime scene to check it out. He finds the freezer, picks up the iced blob gems and puts them into a glass jar. You know, like a... Uh, normal sane person. By now, the blob is huge. Tons of people are dead including the cops, and most citizens are unaware of the danger and couldn't be convinced. Brian and Meg run over to the police department and the secretary says that she can't find him, but she says the deputy is over in the forest where Brian found the homeless man. They need to find someone that has the authority to raise the alarms to state police and the governor, who can call in the National Guard and run this situation up the chain of command until someone with access to firepower picks up the phone. There's no need for any of this because they run into scientists with guns. The head science bro, Dr. Meadows, is talking about how he's in charge of a biological containment unit from the government. The dinosaurs ruled our planet for millions of years, and yet they died out almost overnight. Why? The evidence suggests that a meteor fell to Earth bearing an alien bacteria. 
There is no way this guy is that dumb. He must be bullshitting us. There is a ridiculous amount of evidence that the asteroid impact itself killed the dinosaurs. It's also highly unlikely that the Chicxulub impactor deposited alien microbes, considering the impact generated temperatures exceeding the surface of the sun. The meteorites that seed life on planets are small and slow enough that the impact doesn't kill the microbes. Later on we find out it is all bullshit to conceal the fact that it was actually a crashed satellite they sent into space containing a path they wanted to experiment on for bioweapons research. Which sounds crazy, but we routinely experiment on microbes by placing them on the International Space Station to see what the effects of radiation, zero gravity, and other things have on them. These are purely scientific in nature, but I wouldn't doubt we've tested pathogens for defense purposes as well. While a government organization does not know firsthand what they're up against, they do know they've placed Dictyostelium discoidium slime mold in the satellite along with some human tissue, in the solar radiation along with some movie magic plot dust, mutated it enough to where it started preying on human flesh. They also know what Brian and Meg told them, so they probably have a good idea of what they're up against. So how should they contain and destroy the blob? Like we talked about earlier, the blob is susceptible to very basic things like fire, cold, and electricity, but projectile weapons and small explosives are largely ineffective. Slime molds have a certain life cycle that needs to be understood as well. They start out as unicellular amoebas floating around and eating food. Once food gets sparse, they squat up into modal slugs that help them move around faster and consume more and larger food. When the slug can't find any more food, it starts to starve. Seems good, right? Starve the fucking blob out. Problem is, the dying amoeba slug has one last trick up its slime. It produces fruiting bodies which release airborne spores that get carried by the wind so they can germinate and find more food in other areas. These little spores are dangerous as fuck because now they're all over, and if those spores find their way into your nostril or onto your arm, they'll start reproducing through binary fission and mitotic division. Before you know it, you're up the same shit creek the homeless man was. The point is, you do not let the blob starve. It must be killed when it's in its slug-like state. The good news is that this town is a massive food source, so the blob won't go hungry. Slime molds that the blob mutated from aggregate in this stage. They won't intentionally split up unless the food is gone. The blob will stay in this town and grow larger until the food runs out. They need to secure the crash site, quarantine the town, and monitor nearby towns for any suspicious activity. Evacuate as much of the town as possible while ensuring nobody has a mini blob on them. Then isolate and firebomb the blob with napalm using the same F-100D Super Sabre ground attacker planes recently used in Vietnam. I guess since the government is trying to weaponize it, they'd want to collect a sample of it before destroying it. They could use light explosives to break up the blob into more manageable pieces for collection, or fill some water bombers with liquid nitrogen and freeze it. Their fully sealed suits should protect them from releasing chemical signals the blob would use to locate them. PVC acid chemical suits, which I'm assuming they're wearing, provide some protection against the highly corrosive gastric acids the blob is secreting. Fully sealed chemical suits are the best means of protection against being hunted and digested by the blob. Not that you want to rely on it though. They could use bases to neutralize the digestive acids in order to prevent the blob from eating, but again we don't want it to starve and create spores. Bases wouldn't affect its movement either. While the scientists are assessing the situation and implementing protocols, the blob is still sneaking around growing more and more as it feeds on the population. By now, the blob has made it into the HVAC system of the movie theater, which Nerd Glasses goes to check out. Okay, I'm adding never stick my head into a ventilation shaft to check out an issue to my list. The manager comes to check on the projectionist and gets snapped up by the ceiling monster. <laughs> How the hell did he not see the blob on the ceiling when he walked in? 
peripheral vision not even once. The government agents try to herd Meg and Brian into an unmarked van. Who'd have thought a shady government organization wouldn't be hospitable? From Meg and Brian's perspective, it's reasonable to assume the agents just have limited resources right now, so transporting you back to the quarantine zone so they can more adequately assess the situation makes sense from their perspective. It's one of those predicaments though. If you're healthy and you know it, you want out of the quarantine zone where you're bound to be in more danger. But the people initiating the quarantine don't know you're healthy, so they want to keep you locked in. Both sides are valid from their own perspectives. The agents having unrecognizable insignia is off-putting too. You don't want them to exercise plausible deniability once you go missing because they wanted to use you as an experiment or silence you. So I'd be inclined to ditch the agents like Brian to give myself options. Back in the town, agents are going sector by sector clearing the area. I see they're taking the slightly more humane approach of evacing people and then containing the blob. Clearing sector by sector is good, but what I would do is prioritize high population density areas. It's too late to clear out the movie theater though. That's about how I'd expect it to go if shit did get real. No orderly lines or anything, just pure chaos with people trampling each other. Meg finds her bro and his friend at the movies and rescues them. That damn jacket shows how dangerous minor fashion mishaps are in the apocalypse. They get cornered in an alley and escape into the sewer. Its tentacles comes after her, but she's super lucky that the pseudopods prematurely secrete digestive corrosive acids, which burn off her hair. If she got the goo on her head, it'd be game over. Meanwhile, Brian's snooping on the agents, and yep, the blob was created by the government. Why did they put a US flag on a satellite containing a top secret bioweapon project? If anything, they should have put the Russian flag on it. Yeah, this definitely is a government operation. They're lucky it landed within the US in a small town and not Paris or Tokyo. They should have rigged the satellite to explode if it started falling out of the sky so this didn't happen. Now that Brian knows their goal is to weaponize it, he can assume they won't let anyone in the town leak this discovery. They will either all be fed to the blob as experiments or be eliminated as loose ends. Maybe they'll just have everyone swear to secrecy, but I think that's wishful thinking. At the unit's camp, the agent says that it's growing at an exponential rate, and that it's 1,000 times its original size, and that there may not be a nation within a week. The blob becoming the size of the US isn't likely. The blob's growth is strictly tied to its food sources. The bigger the blob gets, the more food it needs to sustain its mass, and the slower it is. Since the blob relies on short-range chemical sensing, it's unlikely that it'll be able to effectively locate and reach distant cities in its slug form. The real threat is if it can release trillions of spores into the environment. These spores can travel far distances by wind or water, as well as if they land on people, vehicles, or animals. With the Cold War underway, they're too busy thinking about how to improve their odds of fighting the Russians. The problem with a weapon like this is that you don't have control. It's not a precision targeted weapon. You can't hit military hardware with it because they're more protected, mobile, and defensible. The only way a weapon like this is effective is if you release it into a population center where it has time to build mass and wreck huge populations of civilians, which is horrible. Wiping out the civilian population in an attempt to destroy a military threat is a super, super last ditch move. Just stick to nukes. You could argue that this blob is easier to sneak into Russia and release than an ICBM which could be shot down, as well as retaining plausible deniability as they won't know who attacked them. Like other infectious bioweapons, the problem is that there's an insane risk of blowback which nukes don't have. All we have to do is contain it properly. As far as the locals are concerned, this is simply a medical quarantine. Yeah, until the blob starts slurping everyone up in town square, but sure, even if everyone does see the blob, they would still have a hard time going against the government and convincing the rest of the nation the blob exists without any evidence. The organism pursued some civilians into the sewer. We need a schematic of the sewer system. We'll contain it down there. I want that organism alive. What about the civilians? They're expendable. Let's be honest, that is exactly what a shady government organization sent to clean up a bioweapon accident would say. Brian gets caught but uses his handy socket wrench to foil the government agents yet again. What a multi-tool. You can fix motorcycles, pick locks, and KO soldiers in one blow.
Fuck, that was badass. And giving him the bird afterwards? This is the hero we need. The agents look over the schematics and come to the conclusion that closing three valves will contain the blob. Yeah, it's not like this thing is ridiculously strong, nor could it just pop a nearby manhole and escape. Meg, Kevin, and Eddie are now trapped down in the sewer with the blob. You wouldn't think a child would get brutally murdered, but the blob doesn't pull any shots. Yeah, he's a goner, just run for it. You literally can't fight this thing at all. Kevin escapes through a sewer drain entrance. Th that is exactly what I was talking about. The blob could escape through here too. The agents show up and start shooting it with their rifles. While the bullets don't have much effect, they do provide the necessary distraction for Meg to jump down and find another way out. Brian shows up, throws Meg onto the back of his motorcycle, and Evil Knievel's past the blob. my man down there we've got to contain that thing now close it off holy psychopath you could easily pull them out and check them for infection first unfortunately things like the milgram's experiment proved that people will carry out horrific orders that they disprove of if an authority figure pushes them enough so that guy had a fucking rocket launcher and didn't use it or didn't think that it could help God damn they're idiots. The greasers usage of the law rocket launcher has style points, but the back blast from firing at that angle would have been extremely dangerous and easily could have killed them from overpressurization. After the greaser blows up their truck they get into a Mexican standoff, which is ended by the blob's pseudopods killing Dr. Meadows. After peppering it with machine gun fire, they toss a bomb down in the manhole too. It looked like an M183 satchel charge, which contains about 10 pounds of C4. While these bombs are powerful, at the blob's current size, it's unlikely to be stopped by it. Chew on that, sly ball. God damn, these lines are corny. I don't see why you'd start patting yourself on the back and celebrating when you have zero proof it's dead. Like we talked about earlier, you have to destroy all of the blob, not just pieces of it. The ground starts rumbling underneath them, which is a clear sign they just piss this thing off. I'd be getting the fuck out of there, but everyone seems to want to stand around and see what happens. Now I know why he hung on to the grenades. To kill himself if shit went south. That's the smartest thing this guy did. I don't know why the agents are hanging around and shooting. It's hopeless. Just run and regroup and find a better way to kill it. Why is there always a religious lunatic proclaiming that this was prophesized, like that bitch in the mist? Where in the Bible did it talk about the blob, bro? Even if it was prophesized, do you really need to walk towards the danger? Finally, they start bringing out the flamethrowers. The blob stuck a pseudopod into the nozzle, detonating the flame pack. In real life, that wouldn't have happened. It would just have put out the fire. The blob is just too big for small arms now. They need those planes to firebomb it or bring out an M67 flamethrower tank. Great job. Everyone huddle up into one big, easy target inside a wooden building when this thing just erupted through the pavement with ease. The blob is slow. You're fast and you have access to vehicles. Just make a run for it. Deputy Briggs pathetically tries to stop the titanic blob with a bookshelf and gets torqued in half and pulled through the wall. Brian rolls up in the Snowmaker 3000 and starts hosing the blob. It's working, but he stupidly drives into the blob instead of reversing and maintaining distance. Meg goes Rambo and baits the blob over to the snowmaker's liquid nitrogen tank with some AR-15 fire. And once the blob gets close, 
She pulls the pin on the satchel charge and jumps off, but her foot gets stuck. Luckily, this satchel charge has a 35 second fuse, which gave Brian enough time to pull her out of the blast zone. The satchel charge blows the snowmaker truck up, covering the blob in negative 330 degree liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen would definitely have killed the blob cells, but you can never be too sure, and it's possible the interior of the blob didn't get fully frozen through. Dave. Bring in the dump truck. We better get this thing to the ice house before dawn. That's a good call, but cleanup is going to be very dangerous. They need to ensure all parts of the blob are frozen for transport. I'd have everyone find CO2 fire extinguishers in the town and send some people to nearby towns as well. Then get someone to bring over an ice cream truck or something to keep it cool when transporting it to the ice house. Each section you shovel into the ice cream truck should be sprayed with CO2 to ensure it's frozen. Just don't mix the blob up with dippin' dots. Once the frozen blob is secured, you can figure out a way to properly Properly dispose of it. The psycho pastor is now preaching the doomsday prophecy at his congregation, alluding to the destruction he's about to cause when setting his mini blob loose. He should never have made it out of the town's containment perimeter with a mini blob in a jar. With how dangerous this organism is, they need to decontaminate everyone and completely sterilize the town before letting anyone leave. With a blob organism being a massive threat to humans, you'd want to implement national and worldwide contingency plans and defenses against it if it ever appeared in a city again. Let's recap how things could have gone down differently. This whole thing could have been avoided if the government organization had rigged the satellite to self-destruct if it fell out of orbit. A reasonable precaution to take for a top secret bioweapon research satellite that you don't want anyone to know about. Even if the homeless man avoided the crash site or was able to sever his slimed hand off in time, the blob likely would have made it into town anyways, as it's very mobile and capable of trapping curious animals. The good news is that his dog got spooked and ran off. Let's just say he survived. Paul made good decisions, but he had no chance with the blob taking him by surprise. Meg also made mostly good decisions. By the time she woke up and realized how much of a threat this thing is, the blob was already too big for her to fight. There wasn't a good way to raise awareness without looking crazy. Large amounts of people had to die for the townsfolk to be alarmed and for outside help to arrive. Scott and Vicky were also doomed, as was the cook and sheriff Herb. The waitress should have run for the police station that was close by instead of getting in the phone booth. That was really stupid and she could have prevented her own death. By the time the government arrived and were clearing sectors of the town, the blob was already in the movie theater. The movie projectionist just had no chance, but his manager easily could have seen the blob on the ceiling and ran before getting killed. The rest of the moviegoers and Eddie also had no chance. With proper weapons like flamethrowers, M67 flame tanks, and F100Ds loaded with napalm, as well as their chemical suits making them invisible to the blob, they should have been able to easily beat it back, isolate it, and blow it up into manageable chunks they could put into ice boxes for research. This would have prevented a lot of deaths. The townsfolk should have just ran. Trying to hide in that wooden building was just stupid. Deputy Briggs didn't have to die. Having a perimeter set up, with thorough containment measures taken for all townsfolk, would have prevented the Reverend from leaving with a glass jar containing the blob. Thanks for watching, and remember, stay away from strange goo especially if it came from a satellite or a meteorite.